So today's ancient witness comes from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 15, verses 12 through 30. The whole assembly kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Friends, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written, and this next bit comes from the book of Amos. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose delegates from among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas and Silas, leaders of the church, with the following letter to the brothers and sisters of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose delegates and send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you shall abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. When they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When the delegates read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. the reading. You see from this title, it says, it seemed. And that's our focus this morning that I want to bring to mind uh, these two little words. Um, when you think about it, much of life hinges on, on that seemed, it seemed. It seems like the weather was going to be sunny, and it is. It seemed like we might be headed for a government shutdown, which I guess for a few weeks we aren't. It seemed, she seemed like an honest person. Or it seemed like a good idea to take that selfie beside the wild buff buffalo in Yellowstone. <laughs> it seemed implies that given all the information we have and given our best judgments, we are moving forward in a way that seems right. And that's what this story kind of illustrates to me from Acts. Uh, though we don't find it literally translated uh, as it seemed or seemed, as I looked at it in the Greek, the word Edoxin comes up uh, three times in this text that was just written. Uh, and it essentially means it seemed. Uh, 
the Council of Jerusalem uh, is trying to, to sort things out as, as Bill uh, gave the context for. This is 18 to 20 years, somewhere around there after the crucifixion of Jesus. As we heard from our reading, the goal of the council was to come to some kind of common agreement as to what were the essential behave, behaviors of the non-Jewish community, the Gentile believers. The essence behind that question is how do we come together in unity when our two Jesus-following communities are operating out of differing cultural norms? The more conservative factions within the mother church, the church in Jerusalem, where, the, where this whole Jesus-following business began, were pretty disturbed by the new Greek-oriented converts to this new nascent Jesus movement. They don't practice appropriate cleansing rituals. They violate certain Sabbath restrictions. They engage in sexual practices that are outside moral parameters, and they have a cavalier and loose association with pagan idols and sacrifices, and, and as Bill pointed out, they don't even submit to the rite of circumcision. And of course, to that point, uh, the Gentile male particularly were sort of winced a bit, uh, but to the devout Pharisaic faction of the Jerusalem church, the Gentile believers were offensive in many, in men, on many fronts. So they ask, how is it possible, can we find unity with these seemingly different people who don't hold the same, and honor the same essentials we do? Now, both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, we have to remember, themselves were deeply uh, steep in Judaism and the culture and the, and the practices of Judaism. Peter, one of the closest we know, of course, to Jesus from the story recounted in Acts 10, is given a vision from God in which he sees a sheet being lowered down from heaven upon which are all kinds of animals. And he hears a voice, presumably the voice of God, telling him to kill and to eat these creatures. Uh, and Peter replies, certainly not. These things you ask me to eat are unclean. And the voice says, do not consider anything unclean that God has made. And then the story says, a, a, what was happening simultaneously was a, a contingent from the nearby town, I guess, nearby town of Caesarea, I didn't look it up on the map, but must be close by, shows up to where Peter is, and they summon him to the house of a religiously devout Roman soldier named Cornelius, who also had a vision telling him to send for Peter. So Peter arrives at the house of Cornelius and shares the gospel with his whole household, and they are radically converted by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he baptizes them all. Jewish man baptizes the Gentiles. So here we have the common human problem, the coming together of different culture and religious factions trying to figure out how to live together in unity as both struggle to figure out what that means to be a community centered around the teachings of Jesus. Now, we know despite the agreed upon compromises made at the Council of Jerusalem, Struggles for unity <clears throat> and harmony continued to plague the early churches. Paul, in his letter to the Gentile church in Corinth, excoriates them for their crassness, their in indulgent, decadent, pagan practices. And to the believers in Galatia, in the book of Gala uh, letter to the Galatians, Paul writes in his letter a strong rebuke to those who insist upon a church that puts the laws of Moses above the freedom of grace found in Christ. So he's, he's working both sides here, trying to, trying to hold a balance. And despite, according to the story accounted in the book of Acts in chapter 2, where the church is, was, where, where we hear about this spectacular launching into the world at Pentecost event, where there are spoken different languages, yet all understood each other and were unified. Despite the kumbaya inaugural 
church gathering where all were united in the table of fellowship and prayers and miraculous healings and holding all their possessions in common, it wasn't long, humans being what we are, that they had to come to terms with the hard work of figuring out how to live together for the long haul. This has been the task, I think, of the church from the earliest beginnings. And why? Because we're deeply flawed human beings. First and foremost, that's who we are. While we may be shaped and influenced by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are also shaped and influenced by our respective cultures. Despite what we may proclaim we believe about Jesus and the love of God being first and foremost, getting along with other people is hard work. The very nature of human community, striving for unity and harmony, is paradoxically, really, a struggle. Redeemed though we may be, we are flawed and creatures who sin, and because it would be immature and naive of us to think otherwise, we commit ourselves to the sacred but difficult work of transformation as a part of our faith journey, be it individually, or collectively. Now, certitude is a fine thing, and it has its place. I want to hold to certain certitudes. I want to feel, I hold to the certitude that I am loved by a force that will never let me go. That's a certitude I hold. I want to rest in the certitude that my life has value and whatever it is I'm doing has meaning. That's a certitude, despite my moments of doubts, that I want to hold on to. I want to be certain that I am a part of an infinite reality within this momentary assignment we call our life. These things I personally want to and do feel on most days certain about. But within the context of these larger cosmic certitudes of faith, much of my life actually moves forward around the two-word phrase, it seemed. Edoxin. The best way, perhaps, to describe this discipline of navigating this condition of it seemed is the practice of discernment to get to the level of action whereby we move forward because something seems to be right, we have to practice the discipline of discerning. And this requires deliberation and thoughtfulness. I know CCUCC, this church, has had a number of situations whereby you had to collectively discern some major decisions. The most challenging, as I understand, was, and correct me if I'm wrong, was the question about what, a little while ago about selling the church or not. But you also have had other times recently, should the church consider a different name? Should the church take out the pews and replace them with chairs? What changes to the bylaws need to be made? What do we uh, cut back to make the budget work? These kind of things require discernment. So one of the first things we need to think about when it comes to discernment is process. How do we tap into a collective wisdom of the group, of the whole? How do we make sure that everyone is heard? How do we allow for dissent? And how do we finally decide on a way forward? How do we do discernment that hopefully feels led by the Spirit? So here are a few thoughts. Small groups. In terms of collective decisions, it often is helpful to have conversation in smaller groups, four to eight people. Most of us have done that kind of breakout session where groups talk over a matter and someone takes notes and the voice of each group is then heard or shared with the larger group and oftentimes some kind of important information is revealed through that. This is a tried and true way for practicing group discernment and I think many of us have experienced it at conferences and so forth. It's a good way. Uh, another thing is prayerful deliberation. 
Now, prayer is too often, is often, not too often, but is often something we kind of give lip service to. We say a few words before our meetings, or maybe we take some time for meditation, and these are all good practices. But when it comes to prayerful deliberation on big decisions, we have to give ourselves space, space of time and space of silence. If we truly believe that God is still speaking and that still small voice of the Holy Spirit is whispering to us, we have to take time for retreat. Go into our prayer closet, whatever that may look like. And what we do when we are silent, and what do we do when we are silent and alone? We can do any number of things. We may practice emptying our minds of racing thought by techniques of meditation, using our breath or movement or a mantra or soft meditative music or sound. We may practice the reading of a relevant scripture text. We may speak our heart in words much like the psalmist, believing that God is listening and God will give us an answer. We may take a long, slow walk or sit under a tree or write in a journal. There are a myriad of ways we could call prayer. It's simply nothing more than opening ourselves up to the wisdom of the universe, of which we are interconnected somehow and tied to. Another way, seems obvious, talking to one another. So we come back again in this prayerful stance into our small groups and we re-engage in conversation with particular interest in active listening and reflecting thoughts and insights and concerns of those who, who are sharing. Reflecting back what we think we heard and seek clarification if need be. The focus then is on understanding more than exchanging and debating. One important aspect of what we could call deep listening is to be attentive, not just to the words, but to the feelings and emotions we are sensing behind the words, especially emotions of fear, as well as emotions of excitement and hope. Okay, another, another thing might be to be methodical, to make lists. You know, we've all done that when we're trying to make a decision, pros and cons. But I heard somebody suggesting maybe rather than making a methodical list of the pros and the cons, make a list of risks and benefits. That might be a better way uh, to do it. The same person also said that after one does the list and does all the calculations and data gathering, after one has done the reasoning and rational work, it's then important to do what he says is intuitive work. By intuitive, he meant check in with your body, your guts, and ask how does this feel in my head? How does this register here, the heart? And how does this feel in the gut? He said those intuitive measures which can be quite subtle, should be in alignment with the list and the rational reckonings that you make. So discernment happens both through our minds as well as our bodies, and this is presumably how the spirit communicates. But it takes time to discern what is of the spirit and what is just of my ego. I have a hard time separating those. I don't know about you. A lot of times it's, it's, it's hard work. So returning back to the original story from Acts, the phrase it seemed, uh, I said this has always been the task of the church over the course of 2,000 years as it seeks to move from place to where it is to a place where it wants to go. For the spirit, as Jesus says, blows where it will, and it is the church's task to pay attention to that. That's the excitement of the faith journey, but it's the task of the faith journey too. A vibrant church is always a church that is open to change and possibility and is willing to risk failure. By faith, we can risk failure because we have faith that God is there to pick us up and start anew. 
God is always ready to sit with us in the muck and the confusion and the stench of life. God is always there to beckon us to come, follow. Remember those words from Jesus when he, when he comes up to Peter and Andrew and he, he, he didn't tell them what was ahead. He just said, come, follow, let's go forward together. And so they took the risk and they accepted the adventure And when we finally do act, and if we should fail, God is always there sitting with us on the side of the road asking, so, what did you learn? Let's get up and try again. As a somewhat recent example that may have some parallels to this story from Acts, we can consider the United Church of Christ itself, this denomination. When the members from the Reformed denomination and the members of the Congregationalist denomination came together, they came together to form one church, the United Church of Christ. It was in the process of discernment that began with an idea, it seemed, to have promise and hope. It seemed back in the 1950s there was a coming together that would offer a healthier, stronger, and more vibrant expression of the body of Christ, and I believe it has. John Wesley is often, uh, the founder of the Methodist uh, denomination, is often quoted as saying, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. It's a good place to start good aphorism. Anytime faith communities seek common work and worship together, there will always be the need to discern what are the essentials that we must agree to, the matters of principle and core values of faith. But what are the things that are not essential? That is, matters of culture and style, or things that may take getting used to, or can be adapted or give and take. And let's always be charitable with one another by assuming positive intent. These are some of the questions and some of the the challenges we have to thoughtfully explore and ponder together as we spend the next few months as we engage in conversation, specifically I'm thinking with the refuge church community, and whether there is enough commonality to partner together, and if so, to what degree. I want to close with a famous prayer that some of you have probably heard from Thomas Merton. I changed the, the, the from first person to um, third person here, so it would include the our instead of I. So it goes like this. Our God, our Lord God, we have no idea where we are going. We do not see the road ahead of us. We cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do we really know ourselves. And the fact that we think we are following your will does not mean that we actually are doing so. But we believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and we hope that that desire in all for that desire and all that we are doing. We hope that we will never do anything apart from that desire, and we know that if we do this, you will lead us in the right road, though we may know nothing about it. Therefore, we will trust you always, though we may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. We will not fear, for you are ever with us, and you will never leave us to face our perils alone. Amen.